guys, how's it going? So welcome to this uh, coaching session. Um, we today are gonna focus on um, turn strategy in position as the preflop raiser. If this is your first uh, session that you've watched of these, um, I'm gonna try to bring you up to speed. Um, but yeah, if it is the first one, I definitely recommend watching part one and part two, where we focused on, uh, on flop strategy. Uh, so yeah, I mean that sets us up nicely for the turn and that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I am streaming today from a standing desk for the first time. Um, definitely recommend it if you are at a computer all day. So let's say you play poker all day, you're always sitting down, definitely want to, you know, every kind of hour switch to the standing desk. Um, yeah, little tip for you there, um, definitely get a standing desk. Right, let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, okay, so we're going to go through the structure of today's session. So what you're going to learn today, uh, we're going to go through a recap on geometric bet sizing. So if you did miss the first session, then I'll bring you up to speed with that. We're going to look at some typical mistakes and misconceptions. Uh, we're going to look at the 30 big blind strategies by turn card and board texture. So turn card this time, key keyword here being uh, the turn. Uh, in, in position turn strategy fundamentals. And then there will be some time for some questions. So uh if you have any questions as we go by all means just fire them into the chat i'm going to keep one eye over here on uh on the chat um but if you want to save it to the end that's absolutely fine as uh as well all right so a few notes then before we begin these post-op solutions that i used uh were ran um with or made with with pyo solver um and i did um certainly for the flop uh, looked at 184 different flops. Uh, we talked about this in the previous two uh, sessions. But say, you know, all the different pairings, so button versus big blind, low jack versus big blind, cutoff versus big blind, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we're obviously, we're just focusing on button versus big blind, but we're getting to the turn after betting, uh, betting the flop, either for a small size or a big size. Uh, and you can see that I run it for 184 different flops. Um, yeah, I won't go into... Um, into that anymore. If you want to find out more about that, watch the previous two videos. Um, we're just going to be focusing on 30 big blinds today. Uh, this is going to have an effect on how big we want to bet on the turn after betting small and after betting big. Uh, if we play a lot deeper, then our big bet is going to be, you know, very often an over bet. Uh, but 30 big blinds, if we bet big on the flop, the big bet on the turn is going to be roughly 60, 62% of the uh, pot. Uh, if we bet small, then it's going to be slightly bigger, sort of 80 plus percent. Um, but I'll, yeah, we'll talk about that later on as well. Uh, we're going to be working in chip EV and not dollar EV. Make sure you grab a pad or paper and some pen uh, and a pen to make notes and definitely rewatch this coaching session. So what are you going to learn today? Well, we're going to go through this recap uh, on geometric sizing and why it's important and useful. And it's actually a lot more useful and important when we get to the turn. Um, we are going to look at how equities change when getting to the turn. Uh, why some turn cards are better for imposition than others and what that means for our strategy. How you can actually group turn cards together to make studying easier. Uh, the optimum strategies on different turns. Uh, so like what size should we choose? How often should we bet? That kind of thing. Uh, and then what we're really focusing on here uh, are the most obvious patterns in these solutions that are going to boost your win rate. We're not trying to play perfectly like this is the frequency the exact frequency we're trying to pull out big takeaways heuristics whatever you want to call them light bulb moments so that you can play the turn a lot lot better all right so let's take a look then at the game tree so what we're doing here we're following the the blue the blue color um now i don't know if you are colorblind you might not be able to see this so I'll bring my mouse here. We're starting from the root and we're going to go to here, checks flop um, out of position or out of position checks flop. We bet in position, the out of position player calls. And then on the turn, the out of position player checks and then we get to decide whether we bet or we check. And obviously when we bet, we can either choose to bet small or bet big. And the same goes for the flop. But if we did small bet and big bet and check, yeah, the tree gets a lot bigger. Um, so just trying to simplify it. That's the, the kind of the, the game tree or the branch of the game tree that we're looking at. Um, so hopefully that's clear. If it isn't, obviously, send me a message in the chat and I'll try and explain it a little bit better. 
All right, let's talk about some common mistakes and misconceptions before we get into this then. One of the biggest ones that I hear all the time uh, or see all the time, uh, especially in sort of low stakes MTTs, sometimes in mid stakes as well, this idea of betting too small with value hands on the turn because you don't want to lose your customer, right? It's absolute nonsense. Please don't, uh, don't say this ever again. Um, this is not a good reason for betting small on the turn. Um, yeah, it's not very good. Let's leave it there. Uh, not having a plan for the river. Now, we're not going to talk about river strategy today, but you always want to be thinking one step ahead when you talk about this right at the bottom of this uh, of this page. But um, yeah, just think about what you're, you know, what could possibly happen further on in the hand and not just be going, OK, this is my decision on the turn and that's it. Next point then is a uh, common mistake I see is only ever finding the natural bluffs. So for example, obvious semi bluffs or blocker type bluffs. So for example, semi bluffs like a straight draw, for example, or a flush draw that actually that might not be the right way to to play. We're going to see some uh, potentially uh, we're going to see in the first hand example how to play straight draws and how it might not go like how you think it should go. Um, blocker type bluffs might be, for example, you know, the turn, there's a flush draw on the turn and you have the ace of that suit. You, you know, you can bet like ace five off with the ace of hearts if there's two hearts out there, um, that kind of thing. So not really a, a semi bluff, but like, you know, having having the ace of hearts blocker makes it harder for your opponent to have a flush draw that can, uh, can continue. All right. Uh, next point then, not thinking about blockers, what your opponent's range actually looks like. I mean, there's no point that we just focus on us. We've also got to, got to be thinking about what our opponent is going to do in uh, in these spots as well. Um, this is another common one. Betting the flop a lot because maybe you've already watched my session on flop strategy. You recognize that in position against the big blind, you should be c-betting a ton of the time. Um, but then you get to the turn, you panic and you don't really know what to do and you suddenly only ever bet when you have something and that's just not going to be a good uh, effective way to approach turn strategy. Uh, this next one, buying the showdown. I mean, this was made popular a few years ago. Um, not going to throw anyone under a bus here, but uh, again, kind of nonsense. Buying the showdown, like betting small on the flop. Uh, sorry, betting small on the turn, so that you don't have to face a difficult decision on the river. Um, you know, I think you should be approaching it from the point of um, this is this is what your strategy should look like on the turn. Where does you know where does your hand sit in in that sort of overall strategy? Not just kind of going oh well I could bet small here and then you know I'd have to face a, a tough tough river decision. So be careful with that one as well. It's kind of kind of up there with not wanting to lose your customer. Uh, and then uh, this penultimate point is wanting to bet an amount on the turns that I have pot back on the river. This was I mean you still see this to be honest. Um, I can't remember the exact formula. I want to say it's something like stack size minus pot size divided by three. Something like that gives you pot back on the river. Something something like that. And I'm going to say today that actually we can move beyond that and go for a geometric sizing. It's like a 2E um, for anyone who likes that. Um, the, two, the 2E approach um, rather than going for like... I'm sure it's like a third of the difference. Anyway, I don't use it anymore. But um, yeah, we see, still see it quite a lot, like a small bit on the turn, you've got pot back on the river and then you can just jam pot. Um, but I'm gonna just kind of explain why we don't wanna be doing that. And then finally, not thinking about the situation and or understanding the why. Um, one of the biggest things we're gonna talk about straight away, uh, or to begin with, is how equities shift and what that means for your strategy. Um, you know, a lot of the reasons why you can bet the flop a lot very, very frequently is why you can't bet the turn uh, as, as frequently. So we'll get into that further as we go. So let's take a look at this uh, quick stat analysis. Um, I'm going to say that neither of these players is probably c-betting uh, enough to begin with, uh, c-betting on the flop. But if we look at the turn, c-bet turn, you can see that um, the player on the left, C betting around 60%, player on the right, 30%. Now, 30% is not just not going to be uh, anywhere near enough. Uh, we're actually going to go through the um, the targets now. But um, in the chat, let's see who is uh, who's paying attention. And if you are watching the replay of this, then 
just you know think about what you what your answer would be here what do you think our target should be for um seabedding return what do you think our target should be for seabedding return if you've got an idea then drop it into the chat right now we're looking for a number between 0 and 100 Okay, so don't do it. Nice to see you. Uh, has uh, gone for 50. Got any any advances on 50, guys? Do we think it's going to be more like 30 or 40? Do we think it's going to be more like 70 or 80? I've seen I've seen both sides of this um, with um, the guys I work with. Sometimes they don't bet the turn enough. Sometimes they bet way too much. They're just like, you know, what? I'm just going to hammer it, just uh, get them to fold, um, you know, steamroll their way to to uh, winning the hand. Maybe not the best approach, but it's what they're doing at the moment. I'm going to try and fix that. All right, so we, we had this uh, we had this uh, vote for for fifty percent. Let's take a look at some um, some tables. So the thing is, it really depends on how big um, you bet on the flop. Uh, you can see on the left hand side we've got after a small flop bet our average is kind of 50 55 percent after a big flop bet the average is much higher uh 60 plus percent so let's just talk quickly about why that might be happening what our ideas are there the um first one that springs to mind is that we tend to use a bigger bet when we have more equity and we want to pile money in right now yes equities will shift uh in those situations because um, our opponent's going to have to overfold in situations where we have a lot of equity, we have a lot of really strong hands. Our opponent's going to overfold the flop, which means that they get to the turn with um, you know a stronger uh, stronger range. But we still have a lot of really strong hands, so we still get to pile money in on the turn. The other idea is that we tend to use bigger bets uh, when we go for a more polar strategy. So let's say we're on a low board and. This time we have some value hands and we have some bluffs, um, but those those boards, so the low boards, for example, uh, lots of things can change. Very very dynamic. Lots of overcards. Um, flush, you know, you can flush could get there or a straight could get there. Lots of things could happen. Um, so, uh, but if we think about it, like a low board, let's say like an eight five four board, we just, uh, bet big on the flop and our opponent just calls. Then on the turn, there's going to be a lot of things that change uh, in that hand. Certainly a ton of overcards that the imposition player can represent. So that's why we see a higher frequency of C bets on the turn if we've gone for a bigger bet uh, on the flop. So the number we're probably looking for is somewhere between 50 and 65. Um, I think if you look at your own database now and you see that your turn C bet percentage is less than 50, it's probably too low. And if it's higher than 65, then you're probably overdoing it as well. Okay, so here's a hand example. Um, so we uh, we are in DTO, as you can see. Uh, we've gone for a bet of 60% on one of these low boards, and then the turn is the king of hearts. As uh, we almost, it's almost like we set this one up, and we have C bet the flop with 10-4 of clubs. Our opponent calls. We've gone for that 60% pot bet, and then on the turn. We have the option between check, bet small, bet big, which is 60% again, or jam. So here's the question for you guys. What do you do with the following hands? And if you bet, what size do you use? Now, if you want to, give me your answers in the chat. That's fine. If you want to just write them down, then that's fine as well. You're just going to write the 10 hands down one side of the paper and then just say whether you would, um, would you check or bet. And if you want to bet, then what size do you want to choose or use? So I'll give you 60 seconds to do that. Again, if you're watching the replay, you've got 60 seconds as well. And uh, then we'll go through the answers.
All right, so what we're looking for here is uh, what size we want to go um, with each of these hands. Maybe you want to use a different size for different hands, or maybe you want to check with some hands. Um, we, want, we don't want the overall strategy. We want the what you would do with each of those different hands. Um, I can tell you now you're not going to do the same thing with each of them. So we, we don't want to have just one sort of generic answer. But as I said, you don't have to give me the answers in the chat if you want to um, just write them down. That's fine as well. All right, let's take a look then. I think we've done about a minute. So here we go then. Um, really, really nice feature of DTO as we get this uh, strategy. And this is uh, how we can you know, set ourselves a little task of saying, right, let's, let's list out 10 types of hand and then see how we think we should play, how we should approach this on the turn and then compare it to, uh, to what we've got here in, uh, in DTO. So uh, Pocket Kings is a mix between big bet and check. Actually, something I should say, is you can see the overarching strategy here is to bet big a lot. And I saw that like 60% and big bet big came in a lot on the on the chat as well. Uh, so that's definitely, definitely true. We're not using a small bet in this uh, in this situation. It's kind of what I was alluding to earlier on. Um, over cards on these low boards, if our opponent just goes for a check call on the flop, is going to lead us to uh, see betting the turn very, very frequently um, and very often for a uh, for a big size as long as it doesn't complete some kind of draw. Um, so yeah, so pocket kings then is going to mix between big bet and check. King queen off is going to bet big. Uh, interestingly, you know, you can see we don't we don't see bet um, all the time with uh, with king queen off. That's why there's only a little bit of it on the turn. King three suit is going to bet as well. Jax is going to bet. Now this uh, this is a mistake that I see all the time is players getting to the turn. They know that the king is a card that they want to see bet a lot, but they're like, oh, what, am, what am I going to get value from? Maybe they'll start folding too much. But 9x isn't going to isn't going to fold here, so you still get value when you bet pocket jacks. Uh, pocket threes now wants to check. You're ahead of some 2x and some draws and some backdoor uh, flush draw type hands, um, especially on a rainbow board. So you uh, you want to go for a check. Uh, Ace nine off gets to bet for similar reasons to pocket jacks and pocket tens. Uh, Ace deuce of hearts similar to threes. Now we uh, are ahead of some 2x hands and we want to. Um, you know, see the river in position. Uh, Jack eight off looks like it wants to bet big. Queen ten suited wants to bet big, uh, and then we get to this uh, the ten eight suited, and I think this is um, quite interesting because this is one of those kind of natural bluffs. Straight draw. We have an open ended straight draw, but it says there that we mainly want to check it. That's what that green means. We mainly want to check, and remember that we're at thirty big blinds. What you'll see, the shallower we get, is yes, okay, there'll be some times when you have a straight draw and you just have enough equity to bet and call it off on the turn. Here, though, the solver's be solver believes that checking is going to be just higher EV. Um, but if we go and have a look at Jack-10, for example, so we have a, um, a double gut shot with Jack-10, more equity. Maybe we, maybe we bet call that uh, on the turn. Um, although, having said that, there might not be a lot of check jamming on the turn from out of position, um, given we see about this so frequently uh, on the turn. So yeah, I think you'll see some of these straight draws, some of the more natural bluffs that you think, okay, well, I can just carry on here because uh, you know the king's better for my range and I just you know have a straight draw. I can certainly get better hands than 10 high to fold. So I'm just gonna continue here. But actually you can see that we, we should be checking. And then finally, 10-4 of clubs was the hand that we actually had. And that is going to go ahead and bet. All right, so let's talk about uh, turn bet sizing. Here's another tree. So the out of position player checks, and on the flop, we're either going to go for a small bet or a, a big bet. If we bet small, we want to have, I think, we want to have dynamic um, bet sizes on the turn. So you can see there, if we go for a small bet, the big bet, the 2E, the geometric sizing, is going to be uh, around 86% pot. That's certainly what it is in, in my sims, at 30 big blinds. Uh, and then the small bet would be th a third pot. Okay. If we go for a big bet on the flop, which is 61, 62% pot, 
then our small bet's going to be 30% and our big bet's going to be 62. Now you could, you know, you could change that if you want. You want the smaller bet to be even smaller, 25% instead. That's fine. The key thing though, if you're running your own sims, is to make sure there's a clear distinction between the two bet sizes. What we don't want to have uh, is to bet 60% on the flop and then to have like 30, 50, 70, 100 on the turn. I think having two like this is really nice, especially shallower stack sizes. Uh, we just want it to be really obvious on the flop, small bet or big bet. And then if we do bet small, a small bet and a big bet on the turn, we bet big, a different size, small bet and big bet um, for the turn. Okay, so let's move on to uh, talking about bet sizing. We're going to recap today on what is geometric bet sizing, why is it important, when should we use it, um, and then we're going to look at how each run out gives us um, sort of an overarching strategy like we had in that last hand, uh, that hand example, where we either big bet and check, small bet and check, or do a mix of all three, big bet, small bet, and check. Now. As we get into it, we're going to see that certain turn cards lead you to wanting to bet big and check. Sometimes um, we can have a small bet and check, depending again on the turn card. And then, as I said, we can have a mix as uh, uh, as well. Um, a question here from Van Helsing uh, says, I heard you're doing a scoop boot camp. What's the deal? Um, if you want to know more about that, I don't want to like... Uh, you know, derail us here, uh, but maybe just send me a uh, whisper. Is it called a whisper on Twitch? Send me a whisper on here, and um, I'll send you the the details if you if you want to know about our scoop boot camp. But let's uh, let's carry on. Uh, so, what is geometric bet sizing? So, this is just a quote from the Mathematics of Poker. Um, you can read that if you want. I remember when I was uh, training as a teacher, they said, "Do not ever read anything off a PowerPoint presentation." Uh, it's just so dull and boring. So I'm not reading it. Um, but basically the idea is being able to use the same percentage of the pot on each street. So you might have heard the terms 3E before, three equal bets. Um, and in the 30 big sims that I've run, we've got 62% pot on the flop, 62% pot on the turn. And that leaves you with 62% roughly uh, back on the river. In the... DTO sims for 30 bigs, they have, I think it's 60 on the flop, 60 on the turns, and then you've got 60% pot back on the river. Now again, there are certain turn cards that are going to lead us to wanting to use the big bet, and I've just used the geometric bet sizing for the turn. I think it's a really, really nice street, a good street to be using the geometric bet sizing. Um, but we don't always use it, right? And there are going to be turn cards where we want to go for a small bet instead. And then there is the formula if you want to use it. Um, I believe it can work with uh, stars caption and party caption and things like that. So if you did want did want to use it, then uh, you can. So here once again, you've seen this before in the first two coaching sessions. Table of geometric bet sizing. Um, today we're looking at the turn. So if the SPR is four, let's say, then you can bet pot and then they'll be, you'll have pot back on um, on the river. Uh, the other one to remember is if your SPR is 1.5 on the turn, then you can bet half pot on the turn and you'll have half pot back on the river. Now that's not listed on this table, um, but I'm just you know filling in the blanks for you. So those are like two little hacks to remember if you don't have this table. Um, honestly, I don't know whether this would be classed as RTA. Uh, what do you guys think? Let me know in the chat. If I honestly, maybe, um, but yeah. So if you don't have this available, which you probably shouldn't have, then uh, then those are the two little hacks to remember. Um, the SPR 1.5 bet half pot as the big bet. And if your SPR is four, you can bet full pot um, as the geometric bet sizing. Only bets the nuts said he's going to pull this out on the turn at his live, next live table. Awesome. Uh, right. Okay. Whew. Let's uh, let's carry on. We're going to get into some. I don't know whether you'd call them dry 
maybe my, I'm going to make it as fun as possible, but there's some theory that we need to just bash through. So let's, uh, let's get into it. The first thing though, the first fun thing to think about is how equities shift and how equities change once we bet the flop and our opponent calls, right? So equities shift quite considerably. Here I am reading the, uh, reading the PowerPoint, as I said, I wouldn't do. Um, but yeah, equities shift quite considerably once the out of position player calls. So we bet the flop, our opponent calls. Very often we've got a big uh, equity advantage as the in position player, and that allows us to bet a lot, right? But when the big blind calls, well, they folded a lot of the trash hands, a lot of the hands that just can't continue. Uh, very often the out of position player has to overfold on the flop. Uh, if you've ever heard any terms like minimum defense frequency, you should not be thinking about them on the flop in spots where you are out of position, you're going to find it hard to realize your equity and you're at a huge equity disadvantage anyway. Um, you should, you're better off overfolding on the flop and getting to the turn with a stronger range than getting to the turn with a really weak range and wide range and struggling to know what to do. Um, when the big blind calls a big bet, the equity shift is even more significant. All right, so you can think about it. When we bet big, well, our opponent's going to fold even more which means they've got stronger hands, even stronger hands, going into the turn. And all of this has happened before we've even seen a turn card. So I always like to think of it like this. Like in position has equity advantage. So this is in position's equity. This is out of position's equity. In position bets, out of position calls. The equities come a lot closer together. Sometimes out of position even goes ahead. And then we see a turn card. And then depending on the turn card, in position goes ahead again or actually stays behind, or maybe it's somewhat, you know, somewhat the same, somewhat neutral. Okay. And as I put here, then things get really interesting because now we understand how equities run a lot closer together on the turn, but there are certain turn cards that we want to bet a lot and certain turn cards where we want to check a lot. So here are uh, some initial thoughts on the turn that I've given you. Who is the turn card actually better for? This is something that should be fairly intuitive, but there are certain boards where it's not. Um, for example, on a paired board, when uh, you bet small on the paired board and the, the big blind calls, the turn is an ace and you think, yes, that card is way better for me than it is my opponent. Um, it's actually not. Um, and I'm gonna show you why that's the case in a bit. But basically, the big blind calls with a lot of ace x. Um, certainly in the example I'm going to show you, um, and, uh, yeah, so we have got loads of ASEX in our betting range, but we also have a lot of other stuff as well. Remember we, we're on the button. We've got, you know, 50 plus percent, um, of hands. Remember our opponent's going to fold and on a paired board, they will tend to overfold. Yes, they can check raise very aggressively, but when they call, they will have you know, folded a lot of hands, but the ASEX hands are going to make up a decent chunk of hands that they get to the turn uh, turn with. So on an ace, it's actually not as good as you think it is. Do we still uh, have a hand that we can value bet? Uh, this isn't something we'll look at today. We potentially could look at it further down the line when we do, you know, what we should do. We are, uh, more practical sort of deep dives like we did in the second session on the flop. Uh, does more equity generally mean more betting? We're going to answer this, this question. Uh, does less equity generally mean more checking, but also a more polarized betting strategy? So for example, on a blank turn card, do we do more checking? But when we do bet, we employ a big bet strategy. Uh, and then while the big blind is very often capped on the flop, so when they don't check raise, we can, you know, certainly versus a small bet, they are, you know, they're not going to have as many uh, top pair type hands, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be capped uh, uh, on the turn, right? They can still improve to a wide variety of hands, as, as you can see there, from two pairs to top pair to flushes to flush draws, etc. I put that, is this true? Remember, this is our initial thoughts. Uh, I always like when we're, when we're doing a study like this to come up with some questions. So maybe we can come back to this at the end. All right, so what is board texture and why is it important? Let's do a quick recap then. So the community cards, that's the cards on the board, cards on the flop, turn, river, uh, they tell us uh, or determine which hands are possible and in what frequencies. The basic ideas then here are monotone boards mean that there are flushes possible, 
Paired boards mean that trips and full houses are possible, and high card boards are generally better for the razor. More advanced principles, there are 1,755 strategically different flops, uh, out of yeah, 22,100 possible flops, and that would be pretty tough to study. Uh, thankfully though, we can group many of them together to make them easier to, uh, to learn. So here's a quick recap from the flop. We have these three types of board, rainbow, mono, and flush draw, and then 12 board textures. For example, two Broadway, queen, 10, deuce, king, 10, three, BBB, so king, queen, jack, queen, jack, 10, low connected, so low that can make a straight, six, five, two, five, three, two, and seven, six, five, and pad board, six, two, two, eight, nine, nine. Honestly, you can group flops together however you want. Uh, I've seen it done in uh, Michael Acevedo's book. I think it was like high, low, low, right? Or high, medium, medium, something like high, mid, mid, something like that. This is just the way um, I learned it. And uh, it's the way that I think is, you know, works for me. It might not work for you, hopefully it does. Um, but if you can come up with a better method, then absolutely go for it. So we've already, we've got the 1755 strategically different flops. Thankfully we can group them to sort of 12 or 13 flop textures, uh, as you can see here. So 12 different flop textures and three different types of board. The thing is though, that once we've got through that, we then have 49 possible turn cards. That's if we discount the two cards uh, in our hand. Thankfully, once again, the good news <laughs> is that we can group these turn cards together um, and here, here are the groups. So we've got an ace, very important card, a uh, card that completes a flush, card that completes a straight, so it could be an open ended straight draw or a gut shot, uh, or a double gut shot, I guess. Um, over cards, gonna be pretty important. Cards that pair the board, really, really important for the, uh, for the turn. And then finally, blanks. So what are we actually gonna do today in today's study? Well, we are gonna explore different turn cards for each of the 13 flop textures and types. So that's the 12 textures and monotone boards as well. So that's 13 in total. We're gonna look at a whole host of different turn cards depending on the flop. I'm gonna get straight into it now. I'm gonna have another drink and we're gonna do two Broadway boards, King 10, three flush draw. So just in the chat, guys, just let me know if you can see this properly. I'm looking at it on, on OBS on this screen and it looks kind of small, but if you've got it full screen, you should be, uh, you should be all right. So just let me know quickly in the chat, guys. Smoke salmon for you says, says yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through this, like basically there are 13 of these slides, right? This could get really dry and I'm gonna do my best, as I said before, to make it so that it's exciting and fun. Um, I've included as many colors as possible, as you can see, to make it interesting. The key thing we wanna pull out is to look at how much equities shift after the flop bet. And then what are the key patterns? Like where do we see a lot of, of betting? Uh, do we see some small betting on blank uh, turn cards or is it big betting or a mix? Uh, what about when a flush completes? What about when a straight completes? Stuff like that. So that by the end of the session, you can say, right, on these turn cards, because you can, you can learn to group them together. On these turn cards, I'm gonna employ this strategy. On these turn cards, sort of subsection of turn cards, I'm gonna employ this strategy and so on and uh, and so forth, okay? So on this King 10-3 board, after a small bet, a call and a check, you can see the equity shift. We have this huge equity advantage, this whole thing like this, and then all of a sudden it actually drops and out of position is ahead before we see the turn card. Now top right, you can see the equities on each turn card. So you can see, for example, um, that uh, an ace puts us back into the lead. Okay, and you can see that a jack or a queen is better than it was on the flop. Now it's still not, you know, it's still not better than the out of positions, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's closer. You can also see that there are cards that are really bad, like a, like a three. It's only 40.7% equity and that, you know, logically makes sense. Going back to one of the mistakes and misconceptions is sort of forgetting about what your opponent's range looks like. We're trying to connect the dots here. We can see, okay, 
when we bet the flop, our opponent's going to continue with a lot of 3x. So we see a 3 on the turn. Our equity is not going to be, um, you know, not that good. Uh, not great on, uh, on a 3. All of these equities, by the way, were taken when uh, the, the big blind checks on the turn. Now, very frequently, we're going to see some leads from the big blind on a card that pairs the board. All right. So it is relying on the big blind checking. Now, there are leads available in the Sims. It's not like they never check. Uh, sorry, they never lead. Uh, so, yeah, they should be still pretty, uh, pretty good to use. Um, OK. So the biggest takeaway here on this board is that an ace gives us the most equity and it's the one where we want to bet the most frequently, okay? We're also going to use a big bet to, um, for most of the most of the time. Uh, when the flush completes, we see a mix of sizes. Um, you can see that uh, if you look at the bottom right, this is the strategies. So the dark red color is big bet, green is check, and then the sort of salmon-y pinky color is uh, is small bet, all right? So most of the small bets are literally coming from when the flush completes and when the 10 pairs. So I think that's a pretty big, pretty big takeaway um, as well. Let's have a look at a blank card. You can see the two of hearts. Our equity isn't great, 45.9%, um, but we're mixing between checking and betting big. And this is gonna be a really, really common, common thing that on a completely blank turn card, we're gonna employ a very polar strategy of betting big um, and, and checking. So betting, you know, betting some value hands and some bluffs and then checking checking hands in uh, in the middle. All right, so this is kind of what we're gonna do, um, how we're gonna approach it. As I said, I'm gonna try and keep it fun and exciting. Um, just sort of give you the sort of the high level, the heuristics, the big takeaways, the light bulb moments so that you can go, oh yeah, I remember this, that an ace was actually really good. It completes a straight, but it also gives us top pair. Big blind doesn't got too much ace X. Um, we just get to bet very frequently on an ace, unless of course that ace completes a flush and then we might have to start using a small bet, but we still get to bet very frequently and we can you know, certainly start thinking about uh, betting thinner for value. All right, so an ace-king-queen board, our equity is huge, like such an amazing board for us on the flop. But once we get called, we bet big this time. Um, look, how, look at the shift. I said this before, but the shift this time is just absolutely massive. We're going from here and then out of position um, is actually now ahead. So on the top right, you can see the equities are not amazing for the, um, for the in-position player. Um, but there's a decent amount of, uh, of betting still on a lot of these cards. So there was a question before, like does does less equity mean more checking? And you can see here that not, not necessarily. You can see that say, for example, on a Jack of Clubs, the imposition's equity is only 50.8. This is one of the highest that it's gonna be. I think it is the highest, right? And yet the checking frequency is only 26%. It's just very tough for our opponent to, to have much that they can continue. We can certainly, we should be betting the board a lot. We're going to have a lot of straights. We're going to have a lot of yeah, other hands that we can bet for value. Our opponent is supposed to fold a lot of gut shots on the flop. They're supposed to. Whether they do or not, like that's up to you to work out. But they are supposed to because the board is so good for us. Um, and it's very, very, you know, it was somewhat more challenging for them once they call with a gut shot, if it gets there, to actually get paid anyway. So, yeah, they end up folding a lot of Jack X and, and 10 X hands unless they have like, you know, a pair in a draw or a flush draw or potentially a backdoor flush draw as well. Uh, okay, so yeah, when the straight completes, then the reason why we get to bet so frequently is because our opponent folds a lot of, of straights or straight completing cards on the flop. Uh, we actually use some small bets in this situation because we can bet thinner for value. We, you know, we still run the risk of running into a, you know, a straight when we when we bet on the turn. So we can actually change our bet size um, you know, and bet thinner for value. On a blank card, you can see once again, no small betting. 
0% small betting on the deuce of hearts. So we are just going to go big bet and uh, and check. We're also just going to go big bet and check on an ace. Um, our opponent's going to struggle to, you know, to continue. They have uh, three bet or three bet jammed, a lot of ace-x pre-flop. They don't have sets. They can have straights, of course. But um, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna struggle to continue very frequently. Um, once again, then we see that the second card pairing leads us to have a you know predominantly small bet strategy, um, and then the six of spades flush completing. We actually go big bet and check here, and a lot of big betting. And I think um, actually, having looked at this now, something doesn't look quite right on the. Uh, on the six of spades there, because if we look bottom right, you can see the strategy, and there doesn't look to be. There's certainly not 68, 69 percent big bet um, strategy. So um, my guess is I've just taken the six of random whatever non spades. Um, you can see that we actually mix between small bet and check with a you know some some big betting as well. Um, this is going to be one of my points, and it was just about to be ruined. I was going to say that very often we see. Big bet and check on a blank. We see small bet and check on the second cards paired. We'll see if that continues that pattern. And then on a flush completing card, we see small bet and check. And here I am looking at this going, big bet? That doesn't seem right. So thankfully we picked up on that before we before we got there, before I went down a certain path and said, yes guys, we get to bet big on this flush completing card because we don't. Right. Uh, Ace-10-9 board now, big bet. You can see the equities shift once again. Let's try and pull out some of those patterns that we saw uh, saw before. Yeah, so only bets the nut says, yeah, the right side indicates a lot of salmon for small bet on spade tennis, thankfully. Whew. Glad we didn't talk absolute nonsense there. Um, okay, let's pull, pull out some of, this, some of the things we've already seen. So like on an ace, we very often saw big bet and check on these ace-sex boards. Uh, on a blank, we saw big bet and check. Well, that's true here as well. Uh, when the turn pairs the middle card, we see small bet and check. Well, there's some bigger betting going on in uh, in this situation now, uh, which is uh, which is interesting. But on the straight completing cards, we still we see big bet and check. Uh, on the flush completing cards, we start to see some smaller bets once again. And actually, the straight completing cards, like a king or a queen, we start to see you know a whole mix of whole mix of strategies. Um, so again, like there are some some patterns coming out here. You can see the equity is not great when the middle card pairs once again. Big blind, maybe, probably. Leads, uh, leads a 10 very frequently, but when they don't, our equity is still not great um, and we don't do as much, uh, as much betting. Um, what I really like is when you can do a side by side or top and you know, above and below comparison, you can see like, how sort of equity leads to strategy. So our equity is not great on a lot of these cards, but we're still doing a decent amount of uh, of betting just because of the nature of the of the board. Our opponent uh, doesn't have too much they can cling on with on the turn you know, on an ace high board. But don't forget that they have folded a lot, and we've seen that shift again. The big equity advantage to suddenly you know being a little bit less than uh, fifty fifty. Okay, this is the final ace high board. There's only four things to look at here, but again, equity shift quite considerably, but there are some really obvious uh, things that pop out here. Uh, you can see, uh, hopefully, this is gonna make sense. Actually, let's just, let's, let's, let's throw it out to the audience. You can see top right, equity, two, two, two through a five, not so good for the imposition player. Why is that? What's going on there? Why is that not good, but then a six and a seven is reasonable? And then an eight, again, is not so good. So tell me in the chat, guys, if you're watching the replay, um, think about it for a moment, write it down, and then we'll discuss it a little bit more.
Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to think about this, guys. I don't know if we've got a shy bunch in. Oh, no, Green Dyke is in. I just came here, so not sure what's going on, but the nuts change. Okay, very, very good. Well done, Green Dyke. So if you think about it, on an ace 8 do board, our opponent's going to defend with um, some gut shots, which is going to be like 4-3, 5-4, 5-3. Obviously going to defend with a two, they're going to defend with an eight, which means that any of those cards can improve our opponent's um, equity to either complete a straight or a pair plus a draw all of a sudden. Okay, and don't forget, we have a ton, like we just have a ton of hands. We see about this board a lot, and so that's why things are going to change. But that's why as well, like a king is really, really, like a really, really nice card um, for, uh, for imposition here. Only bets and that says on a two, three, four, or five turn, out of position has gut shots of back to flush draw that we don't, which hit a straight. Yeah. Um, I think they can defend with gut shots that aren't a backdoor flush draw versus small bet on the flop. So yeah, don't just need a backdoor flush draw. But yeah, they 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 can improve a lot, um, as we said, to either a straight or trips or pair plus draw. Okay. So We didn't really look at like a, a blank card here, but I, I guess a blank would be, well, a blank is like a, I guess a seven. It uh, doesn't really doesn't really change anything. And you can see that our equity is you know, okay-ish compared to how it was from the flop once we get called. And you can see it's big bet and check. So I think we can be fairly confident that on a blank turn card, however you're classing blank, basically something that doesn't pair the board, it's not an over card, um, it's not an ace, doesn't complete a draw. I think I might have said that already. Um, doesn't pair the board. I think I said that already as well. Um, then it's probably going to be a blank and we're going to go for a big bet or check strategy. If there's one thing you take away from this whole session, it's probably probably that because it's a really clear pattern that emerges from, from all of these. Uh, the offsuit six is a, is a blank. I guess that's the thing is like just made me think here uh, the way you said that was that ace eight two rainbow obviously like um, a six or a seven could uh, could put a flush draw out there. I would say that it's still a blank but it's just I guess yeah it is less of a blank because our opponent can now improve to a flush draw but it doesn't improve them to a made hand is what we're kind of driving at here. Yeah you got it any six really. Um... Okay, so even though the draw can get there on a five, for example, we are still going big bet and check. You can see, though, that we do quite a lot of ch uh, checking, though. That is uh, quite a lot of checking. On the king of clubs, um, when our opponent just uh, calls a flop versus a small bet, they're going to have a lot of sort of weaker hands, like an eight or a two or a draw or a backdoor flush draw. On a king, yes, okay, they can have some backdoor, like king x, like king queen, for example, king queen, maybe even just king queen off. Um, so we don't want to go too big on a king because we can sometimes run into a king. But also, if we're bluffing, we're really just trying to target an eight and a two now. And we don't need to go too big. That means it's one of those examples where you get to bet thinner for value, uh, or smaller for value as well. Okay, next board then board where we have a lot of strong hands and our opponent doesn't. Uh, the Queen Jack 10 flush draw board. Equity shift once again from 61 to 50%. Some cards are going to be better than others. Uh, you can see that King is just out of this world amazing on this board. And you might be thinking, yeah, but our opponent calls with lots of Ace X, surely, and lots of 9X. Well, do they? Because we have a ton of Ace X to, to bet this board. We're going to bet very, very frequently for this big size. Um, so do they actually continue with much 9x and, and ace x? The answer is no. And so the king is just going to be way better for us. And you can see that that corresponds with just betting a ton. Sometimes, you know, mix between small bet and uh, and big bet. Uh, blank card, let's have a look at it. Two of diamonds. We see, um, uh, let's have a look at this. So we've got um, our equity is, you know, reasonable, well, okay-ish, 51.2%. We 
We checked for 45.2, but we never use the small bet. So I'm gonna drive this home till, uh, till we finish. Um, no small bets on a blank, but 49% big bet and actually 5.8% jam. Just get it in, just, uh, just jam the turn. This is one of the few spots where we do see some turn jams, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, let's have a look. Um, some other things then. So the straight completers here, like the nine and the ace and the king, uh, we see some small bets. Um, and let's have a look at the flush completing cards. I think this is a good, um, this looks like a better example of when the flush completes and we don't actually just employ small bets. We do, we do have some big bets in there now as, uh, as well. Now, if you're looking at this and thinking, okay, well, I'm taking all of this information in, but like how, how do we actually uh, apply this? I'm gonna recommend after, straight after this session, don't forget what, you know, forget about whatever else you're doing tonight. Um, I want you to get into DTO and start playing some in position versus the big blind, probably button versus big blind, and start playing, playing it through, bet the flop very frequently, um, but obviously in the right spots. And when you get to the turn, I want you to think, okay, I'm gonna group the turn, what kind of turn card is this? Is it an ace? Is it, does it complete a straight? Does it complete a flush? Is it an over card to the board? Um, does it pair the board or is it a blank? Okay, there's six different categories. And you're gonna to start to piece together all the things you've learned today and start to apply it. Hopefully, in the next session, we can actually look at you know, specific hands or specific sort of subcategories of hands um, that we're gonna bet because uh, sort of a little spoiler into that. When we have a polarized betting range on the turn, and don't forget that there is no such thing really as a uh, polarized range until we get to the river because you can bet a bluff on the turn and it improves to the nuts on the river. Um, but this idea of like big bet um, tends to lead to more polar ideas as I'm sure someone like Bowie would uh, describe it. Then we um, oh, completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, we're thinking about these polar ideas. Um, what's gonna happen is we bet, we have like, we have value bets and we have bluffs like this. So the value bets are gonna bet big, the bluffs are gonna bet big, and then you've got hands in the middle that are gonna want to, uh, to check. And our goal really, and hopes, uh, hopefully something we can look at in the next session, is where's the threshold for betting and checking like that where's the line and it might be like top pair weak kicker or it might be second pair or something like that so we want to know where where that line is so you know whether or not you can continue to value bet or you just got to check back but if you've got a somewhat you know weaker hand so a more marginal showdown value type hand then that's the kind of hand that you can start to check back it goes into that middle middle section it's not a value bet it's not a bluff so you just check instead. Now, obviously that does rely on you knowing that it's a spot where you're supposed to do some checking. Because for example, on this board, if you uh, hit a king on the turn, king of clubs, for example, you can see that we're not supposed to do any checking. So we don't want to take like a, a weak hand now, uh, sorry, a, a, you know, a marginal or showdown type hand and start checking it if we're not supposed to check anything. Okay, on the uh, Jack 9-7 rainbow board, you can see that an ace, king, queen, really, really nice cards. Um, certainly with these over cards, we see a lot of, you know, a lot of betting. Uh, so if you look at the ace this time, we're just betting all the time, mainly for a big size, some small betting in there as well. Tiny, tiny amount of, uh, of checking. Again, think about, you know, I said this right at the start, thinking about what your opponent's range and um, strategy looks like. How much ASEX do they actually continue with past the flop on this kind of board? It's very, very different. We're gonna look at a 993 board later where the where they continue with a lot of ace highs. But here, do they continue with a lot of ASEX? You've got to wear that out. Only bets and nuts. I feel like people might check an under pair there without looking at the spot in this way. I think that's really true. Um, on that Queen Jack 10 board as well, say on the king. Like if you've got an under pair on a queen jack 10 board and the turn is a king, 
like you're never gonna win the hand at showdown. What does what's your opponent continuing on the flop? They either have a pair. I guess that you're still ahead of a draw, but you then they're saying, okay, well, you know, try and get there on the river for free. You're welcome. Um But you you can actually get better hands to fold, right? When you've got like pocket threes in that spot or pocket fives, you can get like single pair hands to fold um so always be thinking about about that what your range looks like what your opponent's range looks like i think that's a really good good point from only bets the nuts okay so yeah as i said we're gonna come back to this hand now jack nine, uh, jack nine seven rainbow we're gonna see uh in a, in a minute you know a, an ace high sorry uh an, where an ace on the turn is not so good for you but here you can see it's great and so all the other overcards. Yes, the king and the queen complete some straight draws. They're also overcards. Uh, they make a nine and a seven, like, f you know, feel pretty grim. So uh, we see a lot of betting on the, on those cards. We also see some bets on the blanks, which is like two through six. Uh, six less so. I mean, you can have, I suppose, ten eights already a straight. Um, can we think of, yeah, I guess like an eight five maybe improves? Um, eight five double gut shot improves, so not really a blank. So let's say, let's call it like two three five. Again, two of hearts. We have big bet and check. Um, and then this time, once the straight completes here, we see a lot of small bet and uh, small bet and check. So the ten of hearts and the eight of clubs. See um, a lot of straights completing here. And again, like maybe you're like, you like numbers popping out here. You can see, I'm putting my mouse over here. You like, you know, looking at this and saying, okay, yeah, check and small bet. Or you like more colors, you know, maybe you're a color person and you can see, yep, I like to look at this. Pink color, small bet, darker color, big bet. Much easier to think about it like that. All right, 1093 rainbow. I'm going to whiz through the, the rest of these. Let's see how we're doing for time. Okay, we're doing all right. So once again, here you can see the ace, king, queen, and jack. I mean, it's getting progressively worse, but uh, certainly the ace and the king look to be pretty nice here. Uh, and we're going to be doing a lot of betting, a lot of big betting as well. Um, so you will find 1093, maybe on the low boards as well, 98 deuce, 984, 983, nine, whatever, something like that. Then we get to bet very frequently um, because our opponents are going to fold all of these kind of ace x and king x hands but also we have a lot of those and we can you know quote unquote represent them um but we just have them a lot as well um blank card big bet and check let's have a look at some of these other ones uh so we see yeah the, when the nine pairs we see some smaller betting once again i think that's uh yeah i think it's only one board we've seen that where it hasn't been the case so far um Straight draws completing, big bet and check, and the three of hearts pairs of board, but actually we're still going to be pretty polar in this spot. Um, again, I would expect to see the big blind lead a three and a nine, uh, a decent frequency. Uh, okay, king eight deuce rainbow. Um, I mentioned earlier on, it was like, the reasons why sea betting the flop is so profitable is why you can't like just, you know, bet range on the turn. Um, so we bet we can bet range on this king eight deuce rainbow board, right? Uh, our opponent has to fold and has to overfold. Just really tough to continue here. But because they folded so much, that means that we have to be a little bit more selective. And you can see that our equity drops considerably uh, on these kind of boards. But it never really gets that much higher, right? So an ace only goes up to like fifty one point five maximum, which is you know a few percent more, which is fairly reasonable. But then, you know, an eight and a deuce are going to be terrible. You've got all the low cards are going to be terrible. You've got this kind of pocket of like nine through queen that is okay. But, you know, it doesn't really tip it in our favor. Um, a 10 seems seems okay. And an ace seems, seems good. Uh, so, yeah, we see a lot of big betting on, on these boards. But I would say this is where we start to see this more polarized idea, right? Um, not on an eight, we've seen that before, small bet and check. An ace, um, we see a mix of sizes. But across the board, we see a lot more checking. And we see just when we do check, we just use big bet if we do want to bet. 
All right, now we get into the, the fun, I think these are the fun, this is the fun stuff, right? And I said earlier, yes, I know guys, this might be a bit dry. I'm trying to make it interesting and exciting. I get excited about this because, well, what, what makes this kind of board interesting? What kind of, what, what is it about the 6.5 Deuce board that makes the turn pretty interesting? What do we think, guys? Let me know in the chat. I'll have another drink. <laughs> Demand noisemakers and pyro next stream. Can you imagine just fireworks? Fireworks going off. Air horns, everything. Okay, I'll give you guys a little bit. So Big Blind has a leading range. Uh, do you mean on the flop or the turn, Green Dyke? You're talking about flop. Okay, yeah, I I think uh, I think you're right, um, but we're looking for the for the turn here. So my what are, the reason why I think I get excited about these kind of boards um, is because so far most of the boards have just been high frequency bet, right? And like on an ace king queen board, we just use a big size a lot. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but on a paired board, we can use a small size a lot, uh, especially if it's like queen queen three or ace ace five, ace ace jack, um, king king six, stuff like that. Um, this board though, on a low board, low connected board, we're going to see a lot more of this sort of polar idea straight from the flop and we're going to bet big and, and check. And so like over, um, over pairs or the first over pairs or top pair, top kicker, uh, is going to very often use a, uh, a big, a big bet on the flop, but we're also going to do a ton of checking as well. So you can see there, the equity before we bet is 53.1. When we bet and get called, it only drops to 48.6. So it's not a board where we have this huge equity advantage. Yes, we do have, you know, over pair advantage. Um, our opponent never has a set. They should be jamming pre-flop with all of their pairs, um, whereas we can have some. But they can have some straights, can have some two pair that we, we, we never have, right? So it's interesting because if you look at all of the over cards that don't complete a straight, um, so basically 10 plus, but you could have probably include a nine in here as well. Um, it's just a lot of big betting. And if you look at an ace, we just bet a ton. So if you think about it, when we bet big on the flop, our opponent calls, how much ace do they really uh, have? So we get to bet a lot of these over cards. So I think this is something to look out for. If you do uh, employ a big bet and check strategy on these low boards, low connected boards, look for betting very, very frequently on the overcards because your opponent's going to have a six, a five, a two, a draw, something like that. Um, and that's going to really struggle to uh, to cling on. Let's say have like pair plus draw, for example. Uh, let's have a look. Are there any blanks? I've put here like a 10 of clubs as a blank. I mean, it's an overcard, isn't it? But it doesn't complete a draw. There's a ton of big betting uh, on that card. When the flush completes, so we bet big and our opponent calls, they're going to continue with um, past the flop with a lot of flushes. So we we've got to be careful that we don't just like you know pile loads of money in on uh, on flush completing cards. And again, re like you know, if the first sort of light bulb moment for you guys was betting big or checking on a blank, when the flush completes, you can see we just do a lot of small betting. Yes, there have been some examples of big betting as well. But very frequently we see a yeah, completely different color. You can see, uh, bring the mouse in. You can see that we have all of this dark red when it's not a flush completing card. And when the flush completes, we see a lot more of the small bedding. Um, okay. So low unconnected boards, 9-3 deuce. Uh, this is one of those boards actually where I think see people bet big a lot, um, but actually it's high frequency, small C bet on a 9-3 deuce board. Um, the equities are actually slightly higher. Um, our opponent's missing like 9 deuce off, 9-3 off, uh, sometimes even 3 deuce off. 
So they only have the suited two pairs and they don't have the sets. And so their equity, our equity is slightly higher. We start to see some small bets. Um, but you can see um, once again, that we're generally gonna employ sort of big bet or check this polar idea on the turn. And then we do start to employ some smaller uh, turn C bets when the flush completes. Blank card, big bet and check. Not sure we've seen one that doesn't do that yet. Um, but lots of other things going on. Uh, the three pairing has some small bets in there once again. Um, we've seen that quite frequently. Uh, but yeah, we got some over cards here where we're going to use a big bet. The ace uh, does complete the 5-4 straight draw, but we still have a lot of big betting going on there. And um, yeah, just some, some very similar sort of concepts coming through. So we've got two more boards. We're going to look at paired boards and monotone boards. Here's a paired board then. And this was the one I said to you. That on an ace, it's not as good for you as you think it is. I kind of alluded to this earlier. And if you stuck around till now, um, shout out to you because you get to, to look at this in a bit more detail. So our equity is pretty reasonable, 61% um, when we bet the flop. But once we get called, it drops to 50%. Some cards are going to be worse for us, so like a two or a three. Some cards are going to be better for us, like uh, an eight. Seems to be really stand up. But this ace, this is so strange. We look at it and we're like, but I don't get it. On all these other low boards, not paired board, but a low board, we've seen um, an ace being a great card for us to bet. But you can see here, our equity is actually the lowest on an ace. Uh, and we bet the least frequently. So you can see that as well, bottom right. Equity difference isn't significant, but ace technically, technically worse. Yeah. I think that's fair. So this time we, uh, yeah, some 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 key differences. Then we see a lot more small betting uh, on the turn after uh, small bet flop. We uh, see the sort of more polar ideas on the blanks or like a nine that completes uh, full houses. You know, we have a ton of pairs that we bet the flop with that now improve to a full house. Our opponent has no pairs, only three x, I guess, but we have all of the the pairs that we'd want to continue to bet. Um, to a tiny amount of small betting on a, on a, on a blank this time on the deuce of hearts, but yeah, I mean, pretty insignificant, insignificant, I would say, but yeah, that ace is the one that really stands out for me. Um, and if you look at this board as a solve, then, uh, you, you'll see a lot of ace highs continue past, uh, past the flop. I wonder if actually I can show you this seeing as we're doing all right for time. Let me see if I can pull it up. Okay, right. Okay, I'm gonna do my best here, guys. Pull this in. All right, so versus a small bet on this 993 board, um, you can see all of the ASEX actually continue past, past the flop, all right? So if we go to Range Explorer and go to Ace Highs, out of position, 38% of their range is an ace uh, versus 27% of our range is, is an ace. So on on this board, they've just folded so much. You can see all of this all of this garbage, like king high, queen high, basically the nothing type hands, king high and nothing type hands, have all folded. So much so much of this stuff is all folded, but they continued with um, a lot of a lot of asex. So what that means is that it's just not a good not as good for us um, on the turn. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier on about not thinking about both players' ranges and what it means for for your strategy. So I think this is like you know, potentially uh, another big takeaway um, for you guys. Craig says, ASEX dominate the check call range on uh, on the flop. So you, are you talking about our ASEX hands? So like we have ace king and they never do. Um, or we, we have the better ASEX hands. I think you're spot on with uh, with what you're saying there. But they have a lot of ASEX that continues as well. 
And as a proportion of range, which is really what the solver's using for this, then um, they have a bigger proportion of asex hands, right? We just we just looked at that thirty eight percent versus whatever it was twenty seven. Um, but yeah, we we dominate their asex hands, which uh, which check call the flop for sure. Um, yes, they can have some asex hands that are better than ours, but um, yeah, don't forget as well that idea of like proportion. We have half of the deck to start with, and we see that range, I think, on this board. Um, but uh, yeah, they can they fold a lot and they continue with those asex. So yes, while we dominate a lot of their their asex hands with our better asex hands, um, they just have more of them uh, to be able to continue, and we end up having to uh, do a lot more checking when our equity drops as well. All right. What I meant was asex was the main part of their check call range. Ah, okay, right. It makes that makes a lot more sense. So asex sort of dominates. The check call range that makes up that big chunk of uh, their check call. Absolutely, Craig, you got it, hundred percent. All right, finally then, monotone boards. We're gonna look at this King Jack Ten board. The card that really jumps out here is a Queen. Um, be interesting to see how much Ace X and Nine X continues when we see about the flop. But uh, for the fact that that Queen, you know, really stands out as being amazing for us, we're gonna you know small bet it a lot on the turn. Um, but we see a lot more small bets, I would say, on this, uh, certainly on this monotone board. Our equity drops again, as we would expect. Um, but we just, yeah, we just see a lot more small bets. You can see there's more pink or salmon -y color on the right-hand side. Uh, but you can also see a lot more numbers in this small bet column, which there ha just haven't been really, uh, as we've looked at the other uh, other boards, all right? Um, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a great video I think it's a great video because I made it, um, but it's um, I posted a posted a hand on on Twitter once. It was on a monotone board, and then the turn put out it was like four fourth spade or whatever. And I was looking at the strategy and was like, yeah, small bet or big bet. And um, and Bowie came in and he said, uh, oh, you need to overbet here. And I was like, are you trolling? Like, I, I don't know, you know, are you trolling? So I ran it and of course he was uh, spot on, he was right. Um, and it was really like, whoa, this is, this is mind blowing. So um, I wish I could remember what the video was, uh, was called, but there's a, there's a graphic of like, is he trolling me? And um, he absolutely isn't. So um, yeah, I'll try and find it. Maybe I'll post it in the um, DTO channel. Uh, I'm sure it's in there already. I think he's uh, already posted it, or I posted in it because it was something that he brought up. Um, but in this situation, we do see some some big bets on a spade. Um, so this is where it kind of differs, I suppose, from some of the other spots we've looked at, where it says flush completing. I mean, there's already a flush out there, right? Um, but it's there are going to be a lot of like single spade hands that continue. Um, we see a decent amount of of uh, of big betting, well certainly on a nine of spades, three of spades, four of spades, you can see some uh, some bigger betting. Seven of spades, the example I gave there, really not a good example because it's just uh, a lot of small betting. All right, so that's the kind of breakdown. Here are some ideas, and I want you to tell me in the chat whether or not you agree with them. If you're watching the replay, drop a comment below and tell me do you agree with these fundamentals? Firstly, it's okay if you don't agree. It's just based on what you've learned today. Um, these are some ideas and you can say whether you agree with them or not. Equ uh, equities shift considerably. Some turn cards will be better for imposition than others. You should use a small bet on flush completing cards. More equity generally means more betting for the imposition player. So look out for good turn cards. Less equity means more checking for the imposition player. The lower in position's equity, the more likely he is to have a polarizing betting strategy, or this polar idea, which means that he'll very often just use the big 2E bet, the geometric sizing. When in position has a lot of equity, they just want to shovel in lots of money though, so in position will also use the big bet when he has more equity too. And when in position's equity is high, 
uh, and or but there's an obvious straight, imposition can use a small bet size to extract more value from the weaker parts of out of position's range. Otherwise, out of position can play too easily versus the big bet. Is there anything in here, guys, that you disagree with? I think there's a, maybe a couple of like, mm, not sure about these comments, these, uh, these posts. But let me know in the chat or comment down below if you're watching the replay and let me know. All right, uh, and then that's gonna wrap it up, guys. So um, Craig says he's okay with it all. That's awesome. Uh, if you guys have any questions, anything at all, fire it into the uh, chat now. Green Dark says, sounds very reasonable. Only bets and nuts, clap. So yeah, guys, any questions at all, let me know in the chat. Um, if you are watching the replay and you've got questions as well, I will do my best to come in and and keep an eye on the comments and the questions uh, as well. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to sign off, but I am going to wait at least 60 seconds just in case you're typing out a really, really long question and uh, you want me to answer it. Craig says, what do you make of people who overfloat back doors from the big blind? Um, what do I make of it? Well, they're going to end up with too wide and weaker range. So you've got to make sure that you're barreling the turn at the appropriate frequency. Look for those turn cards that are great for you. Um, but recognize that on, certainly on rainbow boards, you should be floating with uh, with backdoor, backdoor draws. Um, so be like... If you're looking at it and thinking, wow, this player is like way over continuing with, with backdoor flush draw, uh, but it's a rainbow board, like they, that's absolutely something that they should be doing. Can we do more turn barreling versus them? Um, I mean, you need to see a lot of hands for them to, to see whether or not they were actually overdoing it. So just be careful with, uh, with that, I would say. Um, if you take some of the ideas and, and concepts and principles from this, then I think you're going to do... Uh, really, really well. Two-tone or well-connected rainbow boards are where they will overflow. Um, do you think they are actually overfloating, or do you think that they actually are just floating the hands that they should be? Obviously, you think they're overflowing. Um, I'm going to try and find an example. Like um, in this example. With, on this paired board, right? Um, so we already know that they could continue with all of these ace highs. But these king highs as well, I mean, it's not even like back doors here, right? I mean, there's a back door straight draw with the, with these uh, off suit hands. But the suit hands, like they should be continuing with king eight with a back door flush draw. Same with king six and king five and king four uh, and king deuce, all right? So. That should be should be happening. If we look at nothing type hands, you get a similar thing going on. Queen seven should be continuing. Queen six, jack seven, um, queen jack off even, queen ten off sometimes, jack ten off. So I want you to be really sure that it, they are definitely floating too much and not just doing what they're supposed to do uh, on these boards. Uh, I think they're over floating, okay, all their one card backdoors or ace-x high backdoors when they already have lots of straight draws and gut shots i.e. 986. Let's see if I can find find a 986 board. That would be pretty fun to, to look at. We have a 986 board. Mm. 
Okay. So uh, we can see, let's have a look. So So small bets going to happen most frequently on this on this night whoops on this 986 board 42% small bet. So if we have a look at the range explorer and just see what's what. So they are supposed to continue with a lot of ASX with backdoor flush draw. Um, and the king highs with the backdoor flush draw. I mean some of these are gut shots as well, but these like king queen king jack king 10 continuing very very frequently that's also a draw king 10 um but they should be continuing with a lot of these a uh, lot of these type of hands so i mean these are all gut shots these are all gut shots but uh, i suppose these are as well so yeah asex high back doors so let's just have a look at this well that seems pretty reasonable to continue with ace three versus a small bet i guess if you're facing like a big bet then um then that's different uh, so you're seeing like queen four and jack four as well. I mean, yeah, I don't think you're going to have to over adjust against players like that. They're just going to be making a mistake. So just, um, you know, just play good solid poker. The, yeah, they're just going to be doing really poorly on uh, in these uh, in these spots. All right. I think we're going to wrap things up there, guys. I um, hope you enjoyed it. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit the uh, follow button, support DTO and this Twitch channel. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Um, good luck in Scoop if you are playing. And yeah, see you soon, guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.